Special announcement right at the top of this week's episode. This Saturday, the 30th of September, Rhea Butcher and I will be in Houston for a show. And we have been excited about coming to Houston for a while. And we know that there has been devastation caused by the hurricane. So, those of you who have already bought tickets specifically to our Houston show, we are turning those tickets into an exclusive VIP experience for you. Um, And you're going to get information about that. And for those of you that haven't bought tickets, because you are going through some shit, I have a very exciting announcement to make. We've been pushing for this for a while, and we finally just got approved. Uh, This will be a free show. No one will be turned away. So that is Saturday, September 30th at Warehouse Live at 7 p.m. Rhea Butcher and I, it is free. Just come hang out with us, and let's all be together as we recover from (sighs) <sighs> a horrible storm. Feral Audio. This is a show about individual experience and personal identity. There may be times when folks use identifying words or phrases that don't feel right to you. That's part of what we're exploring here. Please listen with an open heart, and as always, I welcome your polite, engaged feedback, and I encourage you to continue the conversation in your life and with your community. Welcome to Query. Hey Queeros, it's Cameron here. I'm downstairs at the Joy Theater in New Orleans, out on tour, and so many of you have been coming to our shows and um, meeting us after, and it's just been such a pleasure. So I just wanted to throw out a suggestion. If you live in Atlanta, Carborough, North Carolina, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., Brooklyn, Cleveland, Pontiac, Michigan, Minneapolis, or Chicago, or Madison, Rhea and I are still going to see you on this tour. Uh, You can go to CameronEsposito.com for tickets. Um, But also, for those of you that can't make it out to a show, I would just ask you to go ahead and give us a shout out on social media. So many of you have found our Twitter handle, which is QueryCast. That's also our Instagram handle. And we have a Facebook page. Please uh, let your friends know that you are loving the show because so many of you are listening. I am floored. Now, on to today's episode. Sarah Quinn! Last week we had Tegan Quinn, and so many of you have, you know, interacted with me either face-to-face or or tweeted at me and told me that you loved that episode. Well, get ready for a totally different episode. It's almost as if the Quinn sisters, though they are in a band together called Tegan and Sarah, are in fact separate people. I loved this conversation with Sarah. I think you are going to love this conversation with Sarah. And next week, Rebecca Sugar. So enjoy today. Today's episode and have a great week. Take my hand, I'll take you so far. Let's go find now who we are. Who we are. Hey, Queeros. It is your pal, Cameron Esposito. You might know me from hosting this show. And, uh, It is very nice to see you, friend. Now, here on this show, something that I do is I have guests introduce themselves. Okay. So, would you like to introduce yourself? Okay, yeah. I mean, I prefer, like, in my contract, usually I do ask that I be introduced. (laughs) It's so that you can say uh, who you are. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do know. Yeah. Um, Well, I'm Sarah from the band known as Tegan and Sarah, but I am my own person. Sarah born, Sarah... I have a last name. I don't get to use it very often. Let me just see if I can f- find it in my brain. It's Quinn. It's Sarah Quinn. Yes. Mm. Hello, Sarah Quinn. Hello. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm delighted on the show. to be here. I'm so delighted to not be with Tegan. Yeah, you guys spend a lot of time together. Well, we just don't get to really do this type of thing together. <sighs> yes, I can imagine that. How many times do you think you've done an interview separately? Like, is there an actual number? Uh, I would have a hard time really coming up with an accurate number. I would say that in the give or take 20 years that we've been doing press and speaking with journalists and just people, I would say that it is in the, it, w- it would be a single digit percentage. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's just not. That's, I, I I get it. Like I get that there's like an interesting dynamic between the two people, and then I also like between the two of us, and so I can see that people would say like, oh, why would we just have one when we could have both? And then I also think that there's the awkwardness. People never would would never say this is true, but I also think when you split us up and you say like, oh, we got Sarah from Tegan and Sarah, it's like I just don't have the name power that Tegan has, and so I just think like people are like, oh, the one with four letters in her name, it's Sarah. <laughs> we got the interview. I don't think they're as interested. Oh my gosh! Even though I do think I'm actually more interesting. Wait, but no, like, is that a real thing? Because you do not so. have the you have the less like distinct distinctive name yeah. in terms of like. I do think it's happened in musical collaborations. Like I've worked on musical collaborations that Tegan has had nothing to do with, and I, you know, there's not like a stitch of her on there. Like you know, not a note, not a she didn't contribute like in any way. And they'll just say, is it okay if we just use Tegan and Sarah though? Because that just it has brand recognition, and I and. And I um, and I and I totally get it. In fact, wow. I think you know, selfishly, even for the work that I do um, as an individual, I can even see that there's brand recognition to use Tegan and Sarah. And so sometimes I'll think like, mm, I actually would love for people to hear this or see this or whatever. So I'm gonna just go ahead and use. I mean, Tegan makes fifty percent anyway, so <laughs> I figure why not? Right. You know. But that's just like something that we came up with in the very beginning that it would we felt felt like everything we do together really in a way enhances our opportunities or gives us more opportunities individually so why not just like split everything equally and wait then, that's real yeah you and guys... just use each other yeah oh that's cool yeah and also like in the state of Cal california uh technically true for my life as well but for a very different reason <laughs> not because like <laughs> oh uh, yeah i mean i have a very different financial arrangement <laughs> with my girlfriend <laughs> it's more like 1920s yeah yeah like yeah, I'm no. Like, <laughs> it's all mine, and she just lives in my house. Mm. Just kidding. No, I'm that kidding. sounds ideal. I'm just right? kidding. I'm just kidding. under lock and key. <laughs> um, get a lawyer. No, I. Well, I. I have a very. I guess I never thought of that. I mean, of course that's true. I just. My name is Cameron. It's the bane of my existence, and also like the. You greatest. don't like your name? I really love my name, but oh. people think it's uh, Carmen as often as anything, oh. mm. and so. That is only very strange when your job does require people to say your name a lot. Mm. Like, I've been introduced as, like, this next comic, <laughs> like, we're good friends, like, you're oh, going to really no. like her, ladies and oh, gentlemen, no. Carmen Esposito. And I have to go out there, and the first thing I have to say is, like, so it's Cameron, which is just a totally <laughs> different name, but, like, really, you know, but, like, cheers and thank you. And It's interesting because I will say that in watching Tegan sort of be misgendered growing up, because of her name, um, I actually found like I, I actually took comfort in be, knowing that my name was super gendered because I looked like a boy, but my name was Sarah. So that like just cleared everything up as soon as like the kindergarten teacher would be like, you know, would would refer to me by my name. It was like, oh, look, there was a knowing amongst the five year olds like, oh, oh. Oh, okay. Whereas, like with Tegan, it was like, oh, she looked like a boy, and she had a name that was sort of boyish or like unusual. And so, I watched that scenario happen. I mean, hundreds of times as kid, like as kids, like I always had the, like I wanted to look the way that I looked, and I liked sort of being like a boy. But my name always sort of freed me from this, like, I don't know what was basically like not was not the correct sort of situation whereas Tegan was like I saw it in gym classes like they'd be like boys on this side girls on this side and then they'd start naming people's names and like Tegan didn't have she couldn't she didn't have the girly name you know or the like more gendered name and so I saw her sort of have to constantly be like actually yeah this is my story I and mean, this is yeah. this is before because I because also like in our childhood Cameron Diaz wasn't she didn't I like remember the moment that Cameron Diaz became a model she was in 17 magazine okay and I was like oh my god thank you like my right. life is about to get so much easier because right. mm. it was a name that nobody had heard before and yeah. people just automatically assumed I was boy and then I also had a bowl cut yeah and like we all was did. gay mm. you had a bowl what, when you yeah when you say you look so like many a boy, haircuts what happened what well, was there going were on? shaved heads mullets bowl cuts we had a we had it we had it all yeah we had it all so yeah i was definitely red i was like straight up like red as a boy constantly i mean uh, I've, I've even said this on this podcast before there was like a time where i was wearing like what we perceive as a like little 
girl's bathing suit, you know, like a yeah. pink one piece <laughs> bathing suit and had like and was just like waiting for food or something. And somebody was like, and what will the young man have? And I was like, oh, my God. That's like, really you must have looked really dude. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I was because in the, ba- the was actually reading. the bathing suit was not. No, I, I don't remember getting getting it when I was in a bathing suit, but pretty much everywhere else. And I remember when I decided like actively to change that. Like, and it wasn't because I suddenly was like into long hair. It was because I was 11 and I was like hitting puberty and was embarrassed and realized that I would have more allies by looking more like my girlfriends. What did you do? I just started growing my hair out. And I I remember thinking it, like being like, I, actually, we were on vac- summer vacation in Atlanta, Georgia, which was where my mom's family lived, my mom's sister and her husband and kids. And it was our one and only vacation we took as kids. And um, it was it was the summer after sixth grade, and I was definitely starting to hit puberty. And um, everything was awkward that summer. It was like bathing suits all the time, pool, beach, whatever, which I loved water and I loved swimming and I was a very active outdoor kid, but I was definitely starting to hit puberty. So I was like get developing breasts and it was like, I felt self-conscious. My cousins were a lot younger than us. So they still sort of had what I saw as like freedom. There was no like worrying about like shaving or bathing suit, you know, whatever. And we... Um, stayed with my aunt and uncle at their house and they had like a they had like a community pool that we would go to <laughs> it's so I could I've, I've literally talked about this in therapy <laughs> like it's like it's a let root, it out it's a let root, it all it's a root out. cause for me it's let a root it cause all out. so we would go to the community pool and it was like I can remember feeling attracted to the girls at the pool like I remember like laying with my family and seeing like little clusters of like teenage girls and being like utterly paralyzed like paralyzed by them fascinated scared attracted but i think my defense mechanism was to realize like oh i should look like them and not in like a self disgust like you know like not not in a not in a way where i was like i didn't think i could look like them i was like oh i've made choices about what i look like and i could I could quickly change those and I could probably blend in more oh, with those I girls. don't know that I thought I could look like th- them, I, like whoever, the, like those girls we know, the, the girls that you're talking about. I think, I, I, I mean, I th- I don't know that I could have looked exactly like them, but I was like, time to grow my hair. Mm-hmm. And I remember growing my hair and entering seventh grade, which was like our junior high, middle high, middle school, whatever, whatever the American version is. But seventh grade for me, I was like, thank God I don't look like a boy because it was like the wild, wild west and just brutal. Oh, yeah. It was brutal. And I was so glad that at the very least I was like blending in as as my sex, you know, like I remember thinking, well, at least I look like a girl and and I'm not getting called a boy. The rest of it was a nightmare. I mean, okay, so I think I had short hair like till seventh grade ish yeah too. and when did you cut it again when i turned 18 yeah i think i i think i had long hair until i was 18 i make it i make a strong link between hair and puberty and hiding like i think to yeah. myself that it became very clear to me that i was gay but also just like didn't want to look like a girl but like i needed to hide that like asap Mm-hmm. Like absolutely, and I grew my hair, and I didn't think about it again until I was eighteen. Yeah, absolutely. And for, actually, for me, when I—I I mean, in terms of hiding, um, when I felt comfortable to like go short again, hair-wise, was when I was in the most partnered relationship I was ever in with a dude. Like, I had really oh, serious mm-hmm. boyfriends, and in high school. The captain of the football team was like my boyfriend and we were like class couple, literally. And I know. <laughs> I know. No, and I think it's it great. was like two and a half years into our relationship. Yeah. I stopped because we, we I went to a Catholic school. You were supposed to wear like a skirt or whatever. I stopped wearing a skirt mm. and I wore only pants, which mm-hmm. was like already like, whoa. And then I started wearing steel toed <laughs> boots. Uh white platform, steel toed wow. boots. And uh white belt. Obviously. Of course. You got to match. Sure. Um, and then I cut my hair off so yeah. that I had like, again, like, I guess like sort of a bowl cut, but I had like bangs and then I, <laughs> I don't know. Literally, I don't know. Um, and uh, so I think it was because I was just like, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I mean, I know what you're saying here, but like, 
Look at this guy. Yeah. This guy's with me. I have me. boyfriends too. So then yeah. it can't be it can't be what you're thinking about this hair. Cause look at this dude. I have this whole okay, so I just I, I just briefly read this article. I don't feel like I know exactly enough to totally talk like I don't know if I'm gonna be articulate here. But I just read this article that talks about like how there's actual scientific research that shows that um that heterosexual men and lesbian women on you know on the spectrum where we all are we actually have a lot in common with them not just not just like our choices or that we both like girls but like actually like our brains are very similar and the way that what? we process That's things are very news. similar but so this is why it makes a lot of sense to me because like one thing i will say is that i never felt uncomfortable with men in fact i felt way more comfortable with men and when i hit puberty all my life would have been so, I, I i desperately wished i could have just like hung with guys because girls were so complicated they were meaner and they were more competitive and they were more confusing they made no sense to me i was also attracted to them i would have done anything just to blend and be a dude it was not even about sexuality for me i just was like hanging out with girls being like Bitches be crazy. <laughs> like, I was well, like, what? That's... And I would hang out with guys and I'd be like, this makes way more sense. That's really interesting. I mean, yeah. I have... Uh, I'm in the middle. I've got two sisters. Okay. And I think I, like... I think I just learned how to talk to women. Mm -hmm. Like, I, you know, my parents are still together. So they were together in my childhood. And so, like, I did have a dad at home. But it mm -hmm. was like... Very um, matriarchal Italian family, mm -hmm. like a lot of grandmas that were super important. My Nana, like mm -hmm. R.I.P. What's up, Nana? Um, my <laughs> sisters, like there was all this. So when I was around dudes, I like, I think I felt like I had to give them something that I like, you know, couldn't give them, which right. was probably my heterosexuality. Yeah. <laughs> so I was just like really confused. Like, oh. and I, I have always had very close, like, they'll be like, like, do you have close like a dude, male friends like, yes, now? Like, yes. Like, I'll always have like a best mm -hmm. dude friend mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, that is totally, but like, Rhea mm -hmm. can go to like a dude's space. Like, mm -hmm. she plays baseball on mm -hmm. a baseball team. Yeah, with I follow men. her on Instagram. Yes. Mm -hmm. I very into baseball. would not like that is my nightmare. Yeah. I feel like I get very like pleasy and kind of like <laughs> hair tossy. I don't know what's happening. I'm reverting <laughs> to this like primal yeah. self and it's very uncomfortable. Um, so when I was in high school, I wanted to just hang out with women, mm -hmm. even though like I had these boyfriends that were my best friend. I would kind of be like, like, you're so nice. Yeah. I like you. Can you go home? Yeah. Like, could, is there any chance you could go home so I could go over to my best friend's house? <laughs> See, and I think for me, like, I I felt that way about my boyfriends. I actually had one or two boyfriends that I really liked, actually, a lot and didn't feel that way about. But a lot of the guys that I would go out with or date or, like, who would be, like, interested in me, I can remember that feeling of being like, oh, how much do I have to endure before I can, like, you know, get out of this? But I had guy like I had a lot of straight guy friends, and I've always had a lot of male intimacy that has worked for me, which has not always worked for the guy. Like I like having guy friends. I like having straight guy friends, and I think there's it's complicated. Intimacy is complicated between lesbians and straight guys, at least in my life, because I think there is a there is a natural intimacy because it's like, duh, we're not going to date. And then I think for me, I'm capable of having that kind of intimacy. But at some point, there's a threshold that is crossed where a guy is like, what am I doing? Like, why do I have this kind of connection with a woman? And I need to have a girlfriend. And I, I'm sp I'm speaking incredibly simply and and that that doesn't cover even like. 10% no, of it shaking my head because I agree with you but it, yeah like, I'm, I'm saying that more like for the listeners like I'm not saying like duh guys don't know how to have friendships with girls but like I have found that I can have really satisfying relationships with men that somehow always kind of devolve back into like you are a girl and I can only hang out with you in very specific situations and it's just like wait what does that mean why we were fine what happened you know and then they just like Whoa, fall well, into an abyss right I mean I wonder if some of that though is not like, I don't know if that's chosen or if that's, like, cultured or if that if there's just, like, a yeah. biological moment that's happening Maybe. there. Because I, because of stand-up comedy, like, mm. I'm around dudes so much. Yeah. And, yeah, like, my best, you know, the, I just remember there was this one time that, like, a dude that I was very close with, really close, but, like, good dude friend, mm -hmm. um, 
said to me, and actually this like wasn't a nice light experience. I can think of other experiences that fall in this line, like where it was like we were hanging out. This is somebody I really counted on. Mm -hmm. We talked about women together. Mm -hmm. You know, we had like so much in common. And then there was like one random night where this guy was like, oh, man, like, yeah, isn't it like so weird that we like can't date because you're gay and I would be like wait have you been thinking about that because like that is that's not weird for me at all yeah. there's not one moment of this where I've been thinking about that but you know like it's because yeah for them like this I'm still in the category but, okay. of thing that okay, they might I'm, be I'm into gonna, I'm gonna jump onto the other side and say like who haven't I thought that about though like that's my response to those guys is like duh like I've I've I can go there with almost anyone like, in my mind, it's like I've had, you know, you're out with friends and you're like drinking and all having a great time. And I'm like, I could probably sleep with anyone at this table <laughs> if we were on a desert island. Like, sure. You know, I mean, like, I, you know what I'm saying? I'm just saying, like, I think we put I think I wonder if like, like for me, I don't I don't really like sweat that. Like, well, I, I guess you know? that's what I'm saying is I don't think there's a weirdness there. Like, I'm not yeah. I'm not saying they're going. If I stopped being friends or close with people. <laughs> Like, mo well, thought right. about having intimate relationships with, or even like thought to myself, like, geez, we really get along. Like, what does that mean? Like, I wouldn't have any friends. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Which is why, I like, and that again, like, that's partly about like, like I have, uh, I've been with the same woman for seven years, and it's like we talk like that to each other. Like, I'll just be like, you know, who hasn't gone out and had those kinds of thoughts? And she's like, yeah. You know, like, and I don't feel threatened. I don't feel weird. Like, I just think we're like, we're not hideous people. We like have pretty good personalities and are like, you know, we have fun. And like, like my, my, the thing that's always disappointed me is that, and actually I, I don't even pin this on straight guys. I have found that even with some girls, it's really challenging. And as I get older, I find that having really fun friendships or like deep friendships with, with anyone is difficult because it's like always sort of loaded or something. And it's, I, I don't know if we're just like, maybe going back to what you said, like some of this stuff is I think social and cultural. Like I'm not supposed to be close with anyone but my partner. I'm not supposed to be close with anyone except for my high school friend. I'm not supposed to be close to anyone but Or have whatever. any like feelings. Or any feelings that- Which that, by the way, I- also, I'm in a relationship where this is something that I just, I mean, I've always, I've just believed in talking about that openly because mm -hmm. I think it's like a dumb nonsense to act yeah. as if like Crazy our, our life has, as if there's like a finish line that we've arrived at. Mm -hmm. And especially if you happen to be somebody that is like interested in somebody of the same sex, like if that happened for you mm -hmm. and you could even talk about like the same person <laughs> and have that be a cool part of your relationship. Yeah. Like that's a bonus. Those are bonus yeah. points to me. It's like a yeah. fun. I don't think it has to be like we turn off and we end and I we finish we, line. I think we like treat ourselves like children. Like we're like we don't have <laughs> enough self control to like yeah. you know like. I, I, and I'm not saying that these things can't be tricky. Like I'm 37 years old. Like I've had tricky situations in my life, and I've been a part of scenarios in which maybe boundaries were crossed or things things got weird and you know and like and you live and learn you know like my my really some of the relationships that I had in my 20s like I don't feel proud of sometimes like the boundary crossing that happened but like but I think we should be allowed to figure that stuff out and if we weren't so hard on ourselves about these boundaries or monogamy or all of these things like I think we would have more satisfying friendships and relationships and um that has sort of been the power of my 30s is like partnering with someone who I could say that to who I was like, look, I don't know if I'm just like totally a wild card here, but like I've I've not like met someone and fell in love and then thought like, that's it. I'm never going to have feelings for anyone else again. Like that's just never been me, you know, but um, but I do think that like that it feels more complicated when I'm trying to apply that kind of logic to my relationships with straight guys like that I, I seem to have been able to sort of figure that out with my queer friends with my straight girlfriends but with straight guys it still seems to be a pretty like big canyon to cross hmm. like you can you can think that I'm cool and sometimes wonder what would it be like if I wasn't gay but like can we just still be friends and be chill yeah I mean I I got over it with that person you did yeah yeah I mean I have guy friends like it's not a total it's not a total like um, graveyard, but it is like I do find that like I mean, Tegan and I are surrounded by dudes like we work with a lot of dudes, but I feel like there's I'm so strict about what I how mm -hmm. I am around them. And, you know, 
This is really jumping but into But that's it. also being a boss. Like, like I mean, there's a, a lot boss. of loaded exactly. stuff there. I was going like, to say, like, you're, it's, if, if it you're in a position weird. of power, yeah. there's, like, there's a lot of different things to what you're talking about. But no, get, go ahead. I don't mean to cut you no, off. I, I just mean say it's, like, it's, really complicated. I don't want to, like, mix up friendships and, like... Because, like, you know, we were talking about, like, more, like, being kids and realizing, like, everything's changing. And as much as I was, like, totally attracted and still obsessed with girls, I remember thinking, like, ugh, being friends with guys would be so much easier. And then I became an adult and I was surrounded by guys. And it was, like, great because I was the boss and there was all these boundaries. And that was really satisfying through my 20s. But now in my 30s, it's a little bit harder because I think I... I actually feel like I'm really going through a phase where, like, I, like, long to be surrounded by women. Like, long for it. (laughs) And, like, in totally platonic way. But, like, I am, like, how many girls can I move into my world? You know? Like, it's just, it's so funny how it flip-flopped like that. And I think part of it is the what is required of the relationships with men when you're working with them. Like, you know, we have the simplest argument all the time about, like, guys just want to, like, quickly take their shirt off and put a different shirt on in front of me. And I'm like, "Mm, what if I did that? Well, number one, <laughs> definitely try it. Just see. <laughs> Just to see. Then you'll know the answer. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it strikes me. Oh, so, like, for people with um, all different types of bodies, mm. your 20s are kind of the same. Yeah. But for people with our bodies mm-hmm. um, in this room, the two of us, mm-hmm. your 30s get a little bit different. Mm-hmm. That also, I wonder if that also is part of it. Because, I, and I don't just mean like the biological drive to have kids if you have like mm-hmm. a uterus. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean like that drive sort of like puts you in an awareness of your age. We are young people. Mm-hmm. Like I'm in my 30s. We're young. Mm-hmm. But women are not taught that we are young when we are in our 30s. Yeah. Men are still young when they're in their 30s. Mm-hmm. Um Men are like, look at this fresh face in their 30s. You know what I mean? And then like in their 40s, it's like, ooh, crow's feet. How yeah. handsome, you know? Yeah. And I just feel like we are sort of like some stuff that's put on us mm-hmm. starts to get a little different at this time. Yeah, like whatever that's fair. kind of like fucking off that you can do in your 20s is kind of mm-hmm. like equal across the board. I was a fucking wreck in my 20s. Mm-hmm. All the dudes I knew were, were wrecks in their 20s. It was kind of like everything was equal and we were just like accruing experiences. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly it's like, oh, you're still a wreck? I've been trying to get a couch. You know, like right. I just, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Like, I, like something <laughs> changed. Um, in terms of like responsibility stuff, yeah. I, I don't know what it is. No, also that's like fair. you become a boss and you're a woman. Like, there's all sorts of shit that you have to navigate. That's yeah. about like, okay, well, I can only talk to people like this because since I'm the boss and I'm a woman, like that's tenuous and it could go away at any moment. Mm-hmm. So like, I actually can't take my shirt off. Yeah, but like if I was a dude and I was the boss, I probably could. Yeah, um, you know. So I just think like. It's like when people, it's like when women in their 20s will say, like, we don't need feminism. And I'm like, oh, my God, oh my God just wait. Yeah. I swear to God. Yeah. Like, you'll, you'll get what, you'll get the thing. I, s- like, I see what you're saying. No, I think, I, I see, I see what you're saying. And I, I, I definitely think in my 20s, I was sort of flailing through what I thought, like, I thought were like really like, strong politics, strong political identity, you know, about about feminism and, you know, and the gender, like, dynamic that we had at work or whatever it was. But, like, it does change in your 30s. And I do think that, you know, part, part of the response to that for us has been hiring older people. And I find, like, you know, like, I have no, I have, like, zero desire to hire, like, a 22-year-old guy to do my guitars or whatever. Like, no. Like, it's, like, I want someone who has, like, work that has family and has kids or like has a lot of experience like I don't know like I want something aged around me I don't want young I don't like whatever I desire in terms of like youth is not the people I employ anymore like it's it's I almost have like the opposite um hiring practices than like the rest of the world like where everyone's like we gotta get the youngest person and I'm like (laughs) how old can we make this band and crew you know because like for me like it's the experience that that I think has allowed us to be like a better band and a better crew. And like, also like, um, 
I think have a have a more satisfying work experience. Whereas, I mean, I I don't know if I thought of it exactly how you're explaining it, but like there is something about young people that I just am like I don't need that in my house. Like I don't need that in my I don't need that on the bus 150 days a year. Like a 22 year old like screwing the world and just like feeling alive. Like I want someone who hip hurts and like you know like has a will. You know. Well, you're also in an in a pretty unusual position in that like your age and your the duration of time you've been doing your job are like they don't necessarily match up the same way yeah so like that it makes a lot of sense to me that you would want to go for people that like have maybe seen some of the shit that you've seen because because i feel like again like you're a young person yeah I mean, we've had 20 years, 20 years of a ban. It's yeah. that that's very that really is a confusing, like lining up of it's crazy. age yeah. versus experience. Like, I also am tired. Like, I don't want to explain anything sure. to anymore. Like, I'm just tired. So like younger people just like want to talk. <laughs> they don't have the fatigue, you know, like that I feel a lot of the time about things. But I think, um, yeah, I don't know. And I mean, a lot of the experiences I had in adolescence, especially around puberty, like around um, how I feel about men and how I feel about women. Just even in this conversation, I realize how arrested development I am. Like I still almost feel the same way about women that I that I that I did at eleven. You know, like when I see like when I see a girl that I think is attractive, I act like I'm I the exact same way that I did when I was eleven. Like I want to look, but I also want to like look away and punish myself or something like that and when i see guys i see something easy and i want to like i want to like bum around with them because they just seem like they just don't have a care in the world like i have these like it doesn't matter how like developed i feel or advanced i feel or like mature i feel like i still sort of have these reflexes and so now i like sort of feel like i'm surrounding myself by those types of people and relationships that are comfortable for me oh, yeah. it's just only ugly girls i'll work with just <laughs> kidding i'm only joking i think i like I th- oh you're talking about gooniness i think you're it's very i am i am but it's like it happens I, I now i realize like i realize how that has like determined so much of my life yeah. you know like how i just want to like be carefree with a cool guy who can just like do a backflip off a picnic table and like stare <laughs> at hot girls and then I'm like oh, oh god man. so like I've sort of like a- we've a- in our 30s we've actively moved away from that and like now I really can like I can sort of compartmentalize those things and I think we've like found really like mature awesome um creative people who respect us for what we've what we've accomplished and what we've done female or male and and don't take their shirts off in front of us I love all of this I love it and I also love that you're st- I mean I get that being that goon hey you know what helps is um like just just get right up on stage you know what i mean yeah. just get right up in that place <laughs> where it's your comfort zone and you're the when you're in that zone where you notice that you have just begun to sweat and yeah. you cannot make eye contact yeah just get right up on that stage i wish that's I what feel, i do i don't do feel that on stage because i don't actually feel that on stage no being a goon yeah. No, I never feel that on stage. Right. That's what I'm saying. Like on stage, I'm a no, different person. No, get up there. Get yeah. up in your powerhouse, yeah. in your like little power throne. Yeah. And then just be like, oh, finally, I can relax. I can relax in front of all these people. When I, and I have them. I have. It doesn't happen all the time. There might be like years where it doesn't happen, or there'll just be like a bunch of it that happens. But like, I will like show up to something. Like we shot this video last year and there was like one person on set who I just like hid from all day long because I just was like could not act like a normal person and my girlfriend was there and she sees me and I can't hide it from her because like that's how arresting this 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 hiccup in me still is like she's just like why are you hiding from that person like you that's you like that person and I'm just like oh god I can't like but I get up on stage Look, and I'm a monster I am sorry that I was on <laughs> that set I would never have come no go ahead. <laughs> You get up on stage and you're a monster. In what way? Yeah, like I just then I, it's like all ego and all energy and all yeah. power, you know. Whereas like when I'm like just sitting in the like catering area at the waiting and waiting to go and do my little stupid thing on the video or whatever, I'm like, oh god, please don't run into so and so. Like I can't see them, I'll just die. You wouldn't do this job for 20 years if there wasn't like the trade off that you're talking about. That's yeah. the that's, that's the so thing. fun. You love it. And I'm I a lo- tiny yeah. little I'm a tiny little insecure person <laughs> inside of my yeah. career. You know, like I'm still. 11 like checking out the girls across the pool in georgia you know just being like i'm nothing i probably would have talked to her to be honest and ria would have been like like at the video you are being yes (laughs) she would have been like you are being ridiculous and i would have been like what do you mean like my voice would have been different what do you mean what do you mean ria 
<laughs> like I would have been. I literally have like a stance. Maybe my, my girlfriend's scarier than yours. Like I just feel like. Oh, she just laughs at me because I'm dumb. She, yeah, Rhea just, just laughs at me. Do you guys feel like you can talk about like in your relationship? The thing, like, okay, I think about this a lot. Like, the thing that drew my girlfriend to me and that I, like, was able to, like, get into a relationship with her, a lot of the things that she liked about me, a lot of things that worked with her, am I supposed to, like, kill that? Like, you know, like, I am, it's a miracle even to me, but, like, I do have an ability to charm people and make them attracted to me against all odds. And... (laughs) And what, what does she I want you to, to do? This is your superhero exactly. power. Like every once in a while, I bring it out. Like, what do you want me to do? You want to kill, want me to kill that? Like, I can't. And so she's pretty understanding. But like, do you feel like you acknowledge those kinds of things in your relationship? Like, are you like, look, oh, the thing I, that you like about me, other people like? Yeah. I mean, I'm the, I'm like, the, like I, I'm just the dumbest at, well, Rhea knew who I was when she met me. I mean, I don't know if this is like, I, what I mean is, oh. I was already, we were in the same stand-up scene. Right. And like, yeah, it's a whole thing. You know, it's like, yeah, if it's like, if you, you know, you know, another musician, you like, yeah, you know, their, their whole shit. Cause you like, yeah, like Stacy saw me, knew yeah. me when I was dating other people. So she saw the shenanigans. You see your whole shit. Yeah. yeah. So it's like a whole thing. So, so really like knew my whole shit. Right. And, um, I mean, it's funny cause sometimes I don't like realize that. I have like no poker face and I'm being mm, me too. hilarious. Mm. And then she's she will just be like <laughs> like what is happening right now? Do you think that straight cuz like I feel like a lot of my straight friends do not talk about this kind of stuff. Like they like I I I know people who like are like we will never like they are like we'll never be attracted to other people again that doesn't exist. I'm not attracted. I don't see other people like and I just think like I'm not saying that queer people aren't like this too. Queer yeah. people are crazy too, but like, I do feel like at least amongst some of my queer friends, like we are able to sort of sort of talk about ourselves in a in a way that feels more relaxed or open ended because we aren't sort of like forced into these like weird heteronormative boxes like everybody else. Yeah, I mean, I also, also women specifically are taught to be like super afraid that they'll be left. Like yeah. that's like a thing, mm-hmm. you know. Women who date men, it's like you know, like hang on to him. Like like literally, like every article, yeah, <laughs> in like a glossy magazine is like keep him at home. You I'm know, like start like, leaving those articles around yeah, my house. It's like really, it's like, Daisy. It's really scary. <laughs> like I, you know, we really scare the shit out of yeah women. Like that. That's the thing. But you know, the th- but do you have that? Like I don't have that. No, that's what I'm saying. So like, so I don't have so i'm not with a but like i haven't read with, those articles right. about like okay because i was gonna say because some girls even queer girls can be like weirdos and possessive oh, and whatever. yeah i don't have that but i don't, like, I don't have that i missed no, that i don't have i missed it too i don't know what it is but i will say i had an interesting to your question about like do have i do i know straight people in this type of relationship i had a pretty cool and interesting conversation with like one of my closest friends who, who is a straight woman that's married to a straight dude and like i know both of them i'm friends with both of them and um we just had never talked about this stuff before and then we talked like had sort of a similar conversation to this and she was like they were very fucking evolved on it okay and i was like dude like straight up you're welcome for like the (laughs) queerness that has like worked its way into your relationship (laughs) um because it was really cool to sort of just hear like i don't know a little bit more well, not more, I like a little less fear, like mm-hmm. a little less fear and, um, you know, whatever was going on for them. It was cool. Yeah. I, I feel like I rarely hear that. I hear a lot more like people keeping secrets and yeah. stuff like that. And that is, cool. that can be like, I mean, th- there's something sort of like interesting in me. I'm like a big reader. I mean, I love to read and I can sort of like disappear um, so completely and some of my favorite things to read or my fa- favorite narratives, you know, often involve like lies, deception, people cheating, people living multiple lives, like, you know, like all these things. And I just think like, how interesting like that. I like so um, like I, 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 I feel so strongly that that won't be the life that I lead. Like I, I, I am like a, a, a full honesty person and I you know I don't I don't I don't want to be that person and yet I'm like incredibly drawn to those narratives and there is something really fun about um reading about it like you know like it seems like everything I read or that I watch lately is like you know people who are dissatisfied and then they're like having affairs and it's so hot and it's so fun and I'm like why don't more people do that 
Well, you know what's funny, though, about what you're saying is that, like, taboos are a turn on. Yeah. And I don't even just mean, like, even... Like a sexy turn on. I mean, yeah. like a brain turn on. Yeah, stimulating. And, and, and just yes. interesting to think about. Yeah. Like, so whatever your personal taboos are, like whatever. I mean, like I, I used to a lot more. Now it's a little hard because of the way that they actually are made. But I used to be super into action movies. Now action movies, like the way that Hollywood has changed and the way that like digital effects have changed. So many people die. Like yeah. there's always so much death yeah. that I like kind of can't see it anymore because it's like always Mm -hmm. mass destruction and like screaming people (laughs) on fire um but like for instance like terminator 2 like i love that movie and i love like linda hamilton in that Mm. and i love her like punching you know like i love all that and i'm like such a fucking pacifist you know but like that gets Mm. me fucking riled up yeah like so i think it's the stuff that you know you go to is like Ooh, could I be this thing? And like, no. Yeah. No, I can't. No, I can't. I can't. Not no, yet. I, can't I can't be killing robots. <laughs> I have to tell jokes. I don't have time for that. <laughs> it's true. I mean, in a weird way, I find it so odd. I never imagined myself really having a career as a musician. I actually really wanted to be a lawyer. And all my, like, all my sort of fantasies when I was younger like, I would go see a movie and then I would, like, get home from the movie and I would, like, lock myself in the bathroom and I would, like, like do scenes in front of the mirror and like make myself cry <laughs> and I would be like I was moving you know so wait you would do scenes in front of the mirror yeah like I would and be like cry, and that was to prep to be a lawyer because I feel like yeah like I was that's like that's also the job of actor yeah that's meta actually that in a lot might of be ways. the job of was acting it, like see, a lawyer I didn't think of it as like an actor yeah. I thought I was like I was giving a moving Right. You know, like statement to get my client off or whatever. But it was like I was acting. I think you were. I was a narcissist is what I was. But no, I, I think you were fine. I think you were. It's committing. weird. Though, that's what I thought lawyer was like. I thought lawyer was like looking with determination. Right. But 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 also sadness into, well, you know, people's eyes. Is anybody in your family a lawyer? No. My dad is a lawyer, and so. so I will tell you what an actual lawyer oh, is. Is it boring? Is that <laughs> My lawyer's life just, seems boring. It just, no, it just makes you, you just know how everything in the room could kill you. Oh. My dad, like, <laughs> oh my God, like literally kill you? What, like, like, um, okay, so because it's like growing accident up. accident law or something? Well, it was like, you know, he would take, you take in all of the shit that, like, the terrible things that have happened and then, like. The yeah. lawsuits that have oh my happened God. from that. Yeah. So as a kid, it would be like, you know, it would be like getting in the car and you'd be like, don't put your feet up on the dashboard. Your feet, oh, your, yeah. your, your, your knees will go through your chest. <laughs> oh, yeah. You can't put a book on the back seat because it could fly forward <laughs> and, decapitate and decapitate you. you. Of course. I, I think like this. No one even, my dad's not a lawyer, but I just knew that made sense. <laughs> Yeah, That's so it's, science, okay? It's super it's scary. It's with being a lawyer. Oh, yeah, it's super scary all the time. And you know about all of his clients. Yeah, I used to have a client. She fell down on the railroad tracks. I'm like, what? Why did she fall down on the railroad tracks? This makes me feel better because tracks. my mother also disclosed a lot about her job oh, to yeah. me as a kid. And I've, you know, I've talked a lot about it in my life where I'm like, would it have been better if my mom had like had more of like a secret job, like where she mm. wasn't coming home and telling us about, because my mom worked in when we were in elementary school she worked um, at the sexual assault center and so there was like stories about like some it wasn't stories it wasn't like we were hearing about her clients but she would say things like if you ever get chased down the street climb under a car and hold on to the like any kind of pipes or any kind of things underneath the car I'm like nine you know walking to school going like well okay I I am effective I am, I am like Oof. I have been given information that would make me effectively like safer if something were to happen but also when I was nine I just thought like I, I mean it just sort of like blew my hard drive and I think I've, I've processed this as an adult where I'm like I really appreciated that my parents armed us with tools and strategies to like be safe but I also feel like um ruined also like as an as an adult because you know like my childhood was sort of fraught with like crazy drama in ter- interior like you know like I would lay in bed thinking about like cancer or being assaulted or all of these things and it was like I think my like nervous system has been like firing on all you know all levels go since like I was little because I was so afraid of everything is that what's wrong with me probably I think probably all of us are like this like is I, I, like now I see my friends with their kids and like 
their kids are like 16 and they like they're like they haven't even told them anything bad yet <laughs> and I'm like at nine I was like running drills with my mom about climbing under cars <laughs> oh, and holding on from intruders yeah but, but this is the thing it made us really interesting kids like you know like Tegan and I laugh about this all the time like you know I, I see kids now and it's like they're playing these interactive games and their parents are involved or at least they're like watching them and like my parents weren't watching us and we were playing prison and orphanage and we were having like you know like thorough sort of social um, you know analysis amongst our friends and we were like playing out all these roles and all these things and it's like my parents if my parents were there that would have been the worst you couldn't oh, properly get into character playing orphanage if your mom is there. <laughs> and that's why I feel like kids, their creativity is being You can if your grandma is there. I only say that because my older sister, <laughs> my older sister would always make my Nana and I be the kids and she would be the mom and mm. also like, <laughs> and also like the nun that ran the school and also like the principal. And we just had to constantly go from room to room to different <laughs> scenarios where she was in charge. And, oh my God. Oh. We had, to say, we, had to do so, we had to do so many tasks. Oh, I love games where there was tasks. I was just about to say, I loved <laughs> games with authority figures and tasks. Oh, Hotel, God. we loved playing. I mean, who knew? I mean, like weird foreshadowing for our future. Right. But like we were constantly checking, checking into in, hotels. Checking Constantly. Out, yeah. Like it was just like paperwork. Did you ever lose your room key in the game? Usually the game would evolve into, it was It was actually, it was called Hotel, but then the, yes. the narrative evolution was that then we would always kidnap someone. So oh, it was sure. like whoever was running the hotel would always kidnap one of the weaker cousins, you know, and we was, <laughs> <laughs> tie him up with my grandma's belts and put him in the, like the you know in the laundry laundry basket but like the thing is the thing that I remember about my childhood is a lack of of authority like observation like whatever so like of course as an adult I desperately desire it and also hate it you know like I love like a good bossy authoritative figure in my life oh, no, you know? not, I have like I had a pretty authoritarian well super catholic you oh. know so there's like a whole my parents are recovering catholic yeah, so there's opposite. like a whole thing mm. where it's like because it's not like i don't know that necessarily my parents were the boss like in in like a very well, like rigid God way was the boss exactly that's yeah. who the boss was and that boss is like so inflexible and just yeah. like real mean and old from a time before and had lots of rules about fish and when you could eat it and like everything was a real problem um see and i miss i mean in some weird like very like basic freudian way it's like you know we didn't have a lot of that growing up and so all of our games sort of centered around this like authoritarian figure not god but right. like the person who ran the orphanage or the person checking you into the hotel or whatever and um all of our games it's like there was always like <laughs> there was always like some poor soul we would like shove into that role and they would always have to be like we would be like instruct like it's very snm actually now that i'm thinking about it but it was like you know like okay I'm making the name up like you tara you're gonna be the orphanage leader if we break the rules you're gonna have to punish us <laughs> but it's like, <laughs> <laughs> like so like you're you're determining the threshold of like what it when you need to be punished or whatever and it's like i mean it's very demented but like this is this is the I kind of stuff it. we couldn't have done if we had been constantly being observed by our helicopter parents instead we had like young parents who were like drinking beers in the backyard not paying attention to us while we were in the basement making Tara so much basement fucking you know corporal punishment us. tough to think about living in California because like no. there's no basements out here and so it's just like and you definitely are not allowed to like there must be like yeah. some like you can't like law you can't play in the basement and no. then no today's episode of Query is sponsored by Zola Wedding Registry anything for love you know Episode one of this very podcast featured an interview with one of my favorite stand-up comics, Rhea Butcher, who I happen to like so much as a comedian as and as a person that I that I married her. And one thing that I will say about the process of getting married is that any little help I got along the way so that I could focus more on love and commitment and the future really meant a lot. So when I heard that Zola was interested in sponsoring Query, I was excited about that because Zola is a one-stop shop for all of your registry needs. Maybe you are planning to have a traditional wedding in some sort of sacred venue and you want folks to register to give you beautiful Le Creuset pots and pans. Zola can handle that. Let's say you want to get married in a rock club or at City Hall for free. 
Zola can also direct people to donate to an Airbnb fund for you so that you and your spouse, and that's right, there are gender neutral terms used on the Zola website, can have the honeymoon that you want. That's what I like about it. I like that it's gender neutral. I like that you can have folks either give you uh, cash gifts, experiences, they can fund an Airbnb for you, or they can actually get you a stand mixer that you've always wanted. So we are really excited to have Zola sponsor the podcast today. And Zola is offering a special treat to our listeners. Go to Zola.com slash query, use Zola as your registry, and they will give you $50 towards anything you want in their store. They carry everything. Again, that's Zola.com slash query. We would play um, Birth of Christ a lot. Oh, wow. <laughs> where oh, God. it was always involved a, a, a cabbage patch and a yellow pom-pom that we were like, this looks like hay. And that would go in a Tupperware bin. And then, like, my sister was always the Virgin Mary. I was like, I call Joseph every time. Like, loved <laughs> to be Joseph. Like, Joseph is, I think, an unsung hero. Yeah. You know? And... um then my little sister, who is like much younger than us, would just be on flashing the lights duty, which is where you just go over by the lights and you just turn them on a bunch. But what's the point of the game? What happens? You just give birth to Jesus. Oh, wow. That's the whole game. You know what I mean? You just give birth to Jesus. You, were, yeah. you never played like a game where you just like, no, you're, you're no just giving, we never went what, to, you never play? we never birthed anything. Ugh. No. Yeah. I mean, we just, I mean, I wasn't giving birth to Jesus. I was like, uh, that's her job. My sister. Death. I'm the... Husband of my sister. Okay, I see. Just oh, wow. yeah. <laughs> that's a whole thing. Tegan and I never played husband and wife. Like that never Well, I was just like, how do I how can I be a dude? So I'd yeah. be like, I collected Ken's. Yeah. I would only play with like Ghostbusters action figures. When I think about it now, I don't know that I the same, all those things, but then I don't know that any of the games really were about being male or female. Like, I don't remember that being like a central part of anything that we did. And actually, I'm blinking on the name of the person, but I read this wonderful essay a few years ago, this woman who's queer, and she was writing about how, you know, for so many kids, especially kids that end up being sort of like straight and wanting to get married and have kids, you know, play is really centered around those kinds of themes. And they're sort of just like, obviously, like, pummeled into us. But for those of us that are going to be be queer and are not going to have those kind of lifestyles, we often end up being more creative and we sort of create these other universes and worlds using stuffed animals or like whatever it is. And like that really resonated with me because so much of my play when I was a kid, beyond the like weird games of authority and, you know, whatever, all of it was sort of centered around these like the stuffed animals and the sort of like, I don't know, like the, the, the nonsensical worlds that I thought were amazing and cool and interesting. And I always sort of like lived in a community amongst all these people. Like I was never like, I'm the mom and this is the dad and we have a baby. Like it was always like, I have 46 stuffed animals and I have names for each of them. And, <laughs> you know, like take, if we, t I always was like, they were always on a schedule. Like if we were going to my grandma's, it was like, I was going to bring these three, but I'm not the same three that I brought the, you know, the two days ago, they all had to have a turn going to grandma's and they all got like seat belted in. And we were, a, we were a pack. We we weren't a family and we were not like a mom and a dad and a baby. We were a pack of awesome people going to visit my grandma. And it was like, I just happened to be the one that could like take control and like belt them in with the seatbelts. But it was like, everything was equal too. And I, I didn't want to be a kid and I didn't want to be a parent. I just wanted to be like with my people. Mm -hmm. I always was like, saw myself as their peer. I think that for me, I was really invested in like, male heroes mm. i i don't know like <laughs> what the thing is i want i mean i like did I you can, like imagine saving people and like saving kids well, in your class and stuff i mean like okay so i wonder like how much of this really i shared with other people beyond my so like i have really close relationships with my sisters and especially my uh -huh. older sister and so we had like a whole a whole land in our backyard uh -huh. where we had like alter egos and stuff cool and I was a prince. Okay. I was like a prince. I had a name, a prince name. Mm -hmm. um, and then also I was super into Robin Hood. Uh -huh. Like I made my own like quiver of like, like I would just like, like <laughs> took apart a tree and like made a bow and arrow, with, like string and whittled stuff and like wow. made a quiver out of like, I was just like really into sort of. Like, whatever images I must have been getting from movies or mm. something about sort of, like, swooping in, like, I really, I mean, God, it's fucking Jesus probably again. Like, just, like, savior <laughs> behavior, like, male savior behavior. Also, my older sister was, 
like super soft spoken and um really like gendered female okay by my by my family and by like the world around us because she just is like if if the word femme means anything she was that yeah and i was just like her protector because people would kind of mess with her and she was like really really skinny and kind of and so i was just like always just like much smaller than her and younger and staying next to her like leave my sister alone (laughs) like like finding my parents email address when i was like 12 and emailing her boyfriends like don't ever talk to my sister again oh my god i'm 12 you know like just like (laughs) i just had a lot of sort of uh protector weird stuff and that was always very male for me i just Mm. didn't get like the i mean i guess i hadn't watched terminator 2 yet so who did you relate to the most in Terminator 2? Like who that you mentioned? Yeah, Linda Hamilton. Linda Hamilton. Yeah, I like love her. See, and I was always drawn to the like feral teen boy. I married that feral teen boy. Have you ever oh, seen yeah. a picture of, of <laughs> Edward Furlong and Rhea Butcher next to each other? I'll... I'll, I'll text it to you later. You'll actually lose your mind. They, she looks more like him as an adult than he does. So it's like funny. really funny. Yeah, no, he's he's great. There's a lot of great characters in that movie. But that's who I, I think I was always sort of drawn to that character. Mm. Like I always was that character. And then like, like I was I was the kid in. Um, oh, what's that movie? Um, it has Susan Sarandon in it, and it was a John Grissom. Gr- Gr- Grissom? Grissom? Oh, Grissom? the client? The client. Like that, if I was to describe my central fantasy, it's basically me as ch- a child in desperate need of someone like Susan Sarandon swooping in, Su- Susan Sarandon swooping in and saving me in a maternal but butch kind of way. Do you know what's funny about that? Like, there's even kind of a haircut. That goes with that, I'm, which I'm, is like I a bowl cut. See, it's like it's sort of actually what my hair looks like now. It's like <laughs> it's like sort of coming down over the eye. I just mean like that type of guy that you're talking about, like yeah. that like young kind of feral kid. Yeah, it's like kind of coming down over the eye. Like it's all from and, the same era. And it's like and they and the, and the like and the older maternal figure sees that this kid has a lot of, enough potential to like spend a lot of that movie trying to save him Absolutely. and protect him. And I think that it like I've done enough therapy to know that like I probably felt like I wasn't getting enough attention from my mom, who was incredible busy and like going back to school and being a boss and just like you know trying to like give us the best life possible but like I was a bit like un you know supervised and I was probably like a little confused and anxious and whatever and I was like always seeking out some sort of like older maternal figure to like see my potential scoop me up and like you know whatever but then also I was like a feral teen boy like who was like get away from me I don't need your help you know <laughs> like you like to oh, make them work for it so it's like when I think of when I think back on it, it's like I don't because like a lot of people. I mean, this is like one of my favorite games is like really going back with queer people and being like, wh- who was the character? Like, who was the person you wanted to be, or who 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 was drawing you into these movies? Because sometimes it's totally object affection, right? Like it's like, oh, I wanted to sleep with so and so, so the whole movie is about like that sexual attraction. But for me, it was always finding myself in the film and like being able to say like, oh, that's who I am. Like that's who I am, and that's what I'm looking for. Not necessarily like a sexual attraction. What was like on your wall when you were a kid? Nuke is on the block, major posters. But again, I think that was about me seeing myself in them, like yeah. thinking like I wish I was like rad, like the new kids. Um, when I was a little kid, like I loved animals, and I had like I had like stuffed stuffed animals galore and like whatever. And then promptly, like the year I basically turned like eleven or twelve, it became like everything was music. It was like floor to ceiling, every like literally the ceiling as well. Like everything was music bands. Um, we had a subscription to Rolling Stone and Spin, and it was like we just like tore like it was like we weren't even reading. We were just like tearing the pages out and like stabbing pins into the walls and putting everything up. And it was like, um, yeah, just like all music focused. Did you have a musician that? you looked at the same way you're talking about that character, that movie character, like, that you saw. That's no. me. No. And didn't. And actually, I think that's what prevented me for a long time from even accepting my own identity. Like, even when I was actually a musician, I found myself always sort of making excuses or sort of sidestepping this idea that I was an artist. And I always sort of was, like, saying, like, this person's a real artist or this person's a real musician. And I didn't really have a sense of my identity I didn't have any sort of pride or even confidence in my identity for like probably into my late 20s or early 30s. Like I really have had like a very difficult time with that identity because I don't I I just don't have anyone. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, actually, some of the people I like adults that I 
consider myself like the close. I mean, this is like indulge me because I'm going to say mm, something please. that's like so <laughs> fucking like self-important and whatever. But like to me, well, when I moved to L.A., a big part of like figuring out how to be here was figuring out how to get my makeup done mm. because I knew that I needed to have it to be on television. Like you can't go on TV with no makeup on because you look like a corpse because yeah. TV cameras are yeah. made it's bad. It's horrible for like yeah. overexposing your face and everybody else has makeup on. Like yeah. it's just like not an option. Yeah. So I, I concur. This yes. is true. Yes. So we've all learned it. Yes. The you, hard yes. way. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and also you, my experience was that because of like my gender, I couldn't go to just like any human being right. and be like, give me the works. Yeah. Because like <laughs> I would end up um, like just presenting in a super different way yeah. than I'm comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So what I eventually ended up doing, you know, now I have a makeup artist that I, like I only work with. Um, but before that, or like in work in building our relationship, what I would be like is give me the makeup that like David Bowie has when David Bowie has like the most makeup on because I actually really like to wear makeup, right? But I like to wear makeup that's like angular, right? And like eyebrow focused, right? And like about like cheekbones and stuff. Like right. I literally won't even let her call it lipstick. She has to call it men's lip tint. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me feel better. Um, but like that's funny. I feel like. Uh, for me, like a dude rock star kind of a thing yeah. was the only thing that I had that made sense as like who I might become as an adult. Because it just like nobody wore the clothes that I thought I would wear yeah. or like had the cheekbones I thought I would have. I mean, if I'm being really like honest, I think that the difficult part for me was that while I loved so many awesome female musicians... I don't think I necessarily totally um, identified as a girl in a lot of ways when I thought of that sort of pr presentation as like my own, my own identity as a musician. And, and in fact, I probably just saw myself as like a pretty straight ahead dude. And so, but then that, but I, like, I couldn't just be like, I guess I just want to look like Bruce Springsteen. Like, you know, like that just would not have made any sense. Like it didn't make sense to me, but, and it would have made sense like in the, in the world at large. So it's like, I really stumbled through my identity for a long time and like how I wanted to be perceived. And I think where we've really begun, begun to feel empowered is actually embracing the idea that, you know, who I am in those photos when I'm like wearing a weird suit and makeup and I look and I think, God, that girl's beautiful like who is that and it's like well it's me but it's like I know that's not really me but it's actually very fun for me now to sort of like see it as a persona like I don't need to find something that directly links to like who I really am in my regular life I need something that I just like feel fun and excited and empowered to try and do and whatever and I didn't really I didn't really figure that out until I was like in my 30s and so my 20s was just sort of like, Ugh, I don't know, what does this look like? Ugh. And now it's like, I'm like, do it up. Like, I can be I can be talking to anything because I sort of <laughs> I actually sort of really appreciate in a lot of ways. Like, I appreciate I really like that girl that sometimes comes out and looks super pretty and, you know, whatever. And then there are times where I think like, oh, I really like that I look super masculine or androgynous. Like, so, you know, now I, I, I feel like my identity is just so scattered that it really it just depends. Like there's years where I've felt I mean, there was years in my late 20s and early 30s where I had super, super short hair and I was about like 10 pounds lighter and I wore, you know, a very specific kind of like sort of structured silhouette and I got called sir and mister and whatever all the time and I felt very nothing. I just felt like, you know, just me. I didn't even think of myself as having any kind of identity. And then it was like, all of a sudden I started to grow my hair out and my body has started to sort of change a bit. And it's like, I'm like totally embracing being really more femme from my for like for me for my style and like I, it just sort of like changes and but it, and yeah it was never one type of person it was never one type of thing that I like felt that I felt drawn to ever like d when you say like you just know like oh it's David Bowie like whatever I'm like I don't really know I just don't have that that's weird actually when I you, don't think that's weird I mean just it's so weird you, it's so weird you know. for me it just feels more like it just feels very 
it just is always changing. I, I sort of find myself really surprised, actually. Like, I'll just go through, like, complete phases where I'm like, wow, I was really going through a phase, you know? And actually, something you were saying about, like, when you were, um, you know, when you were moving here and you realized, like, you had to, like, do this thing because it was like, like, do the makeup because you were going to look bad on TV or what? Like, everybody has to do that. Like, for a long time, I was very stubborn about it because I just was like, I'm not going to do something that doesn't feel like me. And actually, now I feel very, I get excited to do things that don't feel like me like I sort of I sort of feel powerful when I'm being those people now that doesn't sound weird I think <laughs> that what's really cool about what you just said is you know I god I mean ah I'm like so jazzed that we're living right now <laughs> it's great yeah because I think that Oh, it's like, of course, everything's a spectrum. And even the way that you are on the spectrum is a spectrum. Yeah. And like, it's just it's like spectrums within spectrums within. Mm -hmm. Like, of course, that's true. Yeah. Because like, we're growing up and we're evolving. We're experiencing new things. New things are coming. Like, yeah. we're see we, I mean, like, style changes. Mm -hmm. So like, would that mean that like our accessibility to i mean i've been starting to wear like looser legged pants which has been like a gender adjustment because i was wearing very tight legged pants for such a long time and uh -huh. i feel like i'm presenting really differently now and yeah. it's like those little things like i had to stop wearing those tight pants because like that shit is done like i had to like leave it behind it's n no longer happening in comedy um but do you know this is the thing though is like i think you know, for me, because I am, I mean, I'm now I'm thinking about like when I said I was like crying in front of the mirror, pretending to be a lawyer, but really I was just like trying out as an actor. But like, I, I think that's how I feel about me in general is like, I probably my truest self is like when I like wake up at seven in the morning and stumble in my like baggy, disgusting pajamas and my hair is gross and I like let the cats out onto the deck and like I catch a glimpse at myself and I think this is a horrible person. Like I would never be attracted to myself. Like it's just terrible. And yet there's like then I think about like some of these like really glammed out images that will like project onto into the world. And it's like those images are me, too. You know, like when I'm in my like, you know, my Alexander McQueen, like three thousand dollar suit that's like literally bolted with like so many things in the back so that it even looks like it fits me. And like <laughs> my hair's like crazy. They've been working on my face for like hours. And then I look at that photo and I think like, sure. I mean, I know it's fake, but it's like it's still kind of me. And those two people like that. That like sloppy weirdo who like is letting the cats out on the deck at seven in the morning and like the person wearing the like sick suit who looks hot like that is me and I can be both of those people and I can probably be a million things in between. But, you know, but the probably like the truest, realest version of me is the person who still gets stressed out to go buy underwear because it's like I don't know where I'm supposed to go, you know, or like I feel in, I feel uncomfortable at the yoga in the yoga gym going into the women's locker room still like I'm still 11 years old and I'm scared I'm gonna see like a hot girl's boobs you know like it's just like that's probably the truest essence of me but like I can also be a totally different person and it and you are right it's an amazing time to be able to even talk about that because I think there's more of us out there that feel that way than just queer people I think probably sometimes straight people feel that way and I just don't think we talk about it enough you know I, that's kind of exactly what I meant earlier when I was saying about those like straight friends like oh you're welcome for queering your relationship like i know i was joking but like i really do think that i think this like my the reason i think that i'm like oh i want to do this podcast is because you and i have had like a free-flowing conversation where we have understood what each other is talking about and mm -hmm. it's partially because like of lived experience it's also partially because of like sort of what's in the air right now and oh, yeah. like what is being accepted for us like we can accept each other because there's like a lot of literature that supports us and there's like yeah. thought leaders and there's you yeah. know twitter accounts and like we're in this zone and so like this is why I want to have these conversations where, like, we talk to each other because I feel like you're exactly right. And everybody is, like, a different guy every minute. And yeah. it's fine to do that. Yeah. And I think that we just have a little bit more acceptance yeah. 
for talking about these things. So like, and, and it's and cool when, to talk about it because and when they, they can stray. tell other people. Yeah, no, it's, it's cool. True. It's when they stray because it's like straight, straight people get to do it all the time. My stepdad, like, I mean, you're talking about these like masculine identities and this kind of savior thing. Like, men get to do that all the time. No one has to explain that. Like, if my stepdad was like, well, and during the day I work on a construction site, but at night I'm an amazing goalie. That was his real life. Like, he really did that, you know? Or like, be, like I think as long as we're sticking to or like falling within some sort of like predetermined boundary it's like okay to kind of be adventurous and try different things but it's like we are in a we're in sort of uncharted territory and like i think eventually this won't even seem that like oh my god like sometimes you wear a suit and makeup i know and sometimes you wear white like jeans and a plaid shirt like who right. gives a shit like it doesn't really matter or like you know, for me, I think about my my relationship with my girlfriend. Like, when I started dating her, she had never been with another woman. And I acted like she was, like, you know, this trailblazing, like, you know, crazy, like, I don't know. Like, like I just was like, is this mind-blowing? And she was like, not really. <laughs> you know, like, for her, she just was like... You know, like, obviously, there's an anatomy difference, of course, and there's, like, sort of, sort of, like, I mean, there's lots of differences. But for her, she was like, you have so many of the things that I have looked for in people and found in people in the past, and they just happen to be dudes. And, like, now you're, you just happen to be this girl who I, like, have fallen in love with and like all these things. And, you know, her flexibility and her openness around that made me realize, like, I don't know that we're that unique. You know, this feels unique and, like, a a different kind of conversation because people, like you said, haven't been here that conversation or like maybe they haven't been seeing these relationships in the public eye or whatever it is but eventually it's gonna all just look the same because we're all kind of doing the same thing i hope that that's true i really and do i also think that you know this is gonna be like a super serious f- button on what that you know i think when we talk about um huh, i actually think that allowing people to feel supported trying on different identities yeah um is a violence reduction yeah. mechanism, mm-hmm. especially for like cis straight dudes yeah. who are so, you're right, they can be a bunch of different things, but so patrolled yeah. about any deviation. Like oh, there yeah. is actually no equivalent to you and I wearing makeup and a suit mm-hmm. for men. No, it's true. And so like, I think that- I mean, the equivalent for men, if guys, like my guy friends who, um, who I grew up with, if they had- played with and experimented with their identity the way we have been allowed to, they would have been... I mean, we already know what would have happened to yeah, them. Terrible crazy. names and then, like, yeah. isolation. I mean, and, in a lot yeah. of ways, we are Anger. sort of part of the generation that already was sort of like, you know, the fact that we could wear jeans and sneakers and cut our hair short since, like, the 80s. Like, yeah. that's... I mean, it's had a lot more impact than we probably realize, you know? So I just feel like if we're working to um, understand each other and, like, take some anger out of the world, I think one way to do that is just to talk about how happy we feel mm-hmm. just experimenting and trying to figure out what we're presenting to the world. Yeah. And then, like, having a, an, an at-home uh, baggy pajamas <laughs> guy. I've got that guy. I th- she wears glasses. Sometimes I think to myself, like, wouldn't my life be better if I, like, just really tried to, like... Like, should I get, like, weird sexy time pajamas and, like, just, no! like... And then I just imagine myself letting the cats out in that outfit, and I'm like, I don't know. That's not... <laughs> but I'm, like, I'm lucky because I get to go out on tour and on the road and stuff like that, and that is, like, a whole different person, you know? Like, and I imagine myself, like, in a hotel room. Like, there's, like, a... I'm, like, now I'm, like, trying to make myself not seem pathetic, but, like, there's a sexiness to my life in a different way. Like, you know, when I'm at home with the cats and my girlfriend and I'm in my baggy pajamas and whatever, like, I'm, like, God, I just gotta live, you know? Like, I gotta let it down sometimes. Like, I just... <laughs> yeah. I can't be awesome all the time. Like, this is just me. But I do catch a glimpse of myself and I think, oh, my God. Do you not realize that, like... It's actually really sexy to see somebody be vulnerable. I don't find it sexy. Like, if my girlfriend looked as bad as I looked in the morning, I'd be like, I got to break up with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen. We have a great guest room. You we... can go down and stay as long as you need to before you find a place. Rents are out of control in L.A., but good luck. We have hit our... We did it. We, like, hit the end of the conversation. And I want to... You... This has been so great to oh, talk thanks. to you. I, like, I feel like we it. could go another hour. I, that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. two to three more hours. No problem. Um, knock them out. But before... I let you go. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to ask you to shout out a queero. So like somebody or a thing uh, that made you feel comfy to be the successful, happy person you are. Okay. I got to think about it a little bit because it was a real, it was a real. <laughs> I know. It was, an, it was the opposite of that for a long time. 
I think, okay, I would say that Emmy, my best friend, who has been the Tegan and Sarah art director since 2002, she was also my, it's not going to surprise anyone listening, but she was also my girlfriend for a time. Um, she uh, ch- totally changed my life and in a lot of ways saved me because she was the first person I met who I could have this kind of conversation with. She was the first person who I felt like externally, like outside of me, I met someone who reminded me of me and who had had the same experiences and who had the same thoughts and who was asking themselves the same kinds of questions about sex and identity and the world and childhood and future and all of these things. And um, and she was totally unapologetic and also was one of the first people I met as a queer person who said, I am homophobic. And I have homophobia and I have to address those things, you know, um, because because if I can't if I can't love myself, I can't love those things in myself and in other people then no one else is going to. I can't expect anyone else to. And I remember that being an important lesson for me, because I think at that time I was about 22, 23 when I met her. I didn't realize like just how homophobic I was about myself, but other people, too. And. In, when she when she said that to me, I remember thinking like I need to I need to learn how to love myself better, and I need to I need to be more loving and understanding of the people in my community who aren't like me or who are too extreme versions of me or whatever it is. And I think I think that that cha- that really did change my life. Um, I believe RuPaul said it best mm-hmm. when he said, <laughs> "If you can't love yourself, yeah. how the hell?" You don't love anybody else. This is this is this is a very true thing. And people I think that what stops people from really considering this is because people assume that if you are queer that you can't be homophobic or that you can't hate yourself. And it's like actually the opposite. I sometimes think that sometimes the people who I've met who seem to hate being queer like who hate queer people or are the most homophobic homophobic are the gayest people I've ever met. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like because I think that there is just something so impossible about it like for them they know they're stuck they can't be anything different than what they are and there's a real hatred or a real violence against themselves and other people and i think um i think that not that i was acting violently but like i think that there was a uh there was a part of me that was really really like just dark and repressed because i felt really bad about who i was and i felt really bad about my place in the world and then i was looking outward at other people in the community and feeling that way about them and it took a a person that i respected who at the time i felt embarrassed when she said it to me you know and i remember that shame having a huge impact on me because i was like i want to fix this i want to be better i want to love myself i want to love other people and i and it really did change my life oh man (sighs) <sighs> mm-hmm. I'm so glad it did. It really did. Yeah, totally. She, she, that's just like one of many things that she really brought to my life. She was just one of those people that I felt like if I hadn't met, I would be very different. Well, shout out, Emmy. Shout out, Emmy. And thank you so much, Sarah Quinn, for being Thank you so much show. for having me. This was the best. It was yeah. great. Was it better than Tegan? Very different. I don't know if you know <laughs> this about yourselves. You're different people with different brains and almost like autonomy and stuff. Yeah, we're pretty different. We're pretty different. I like. I actually like to get that reinforced sometimes because I think it's so unnerving for me how how visually similar we can look sometimes that I'll just be like, but I'm different, right? Or I get tripped out and I think like it's Fight Club and I'm the same person. Oh my god! Well, and you're let me just say me? no. Let me just say. I mean, this is like <laughs> one guy's opinion. I do not think you sound alike. Mm. I think, like, I believe that you're in the same family. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I also <laughs> think that you have different faces, <laughs> you know, but I believe you're in the same family. I think a lot of people uh, meet us and can s- determine, like, the differences between us almost immediately. And I don't think it's a choice. I think there are just some people in this world who will never know us different, like, as being different. Like, oh, yeah. We meet people and they're just, like, flustered and they will never figure out which one's which. They can't call you they're by name. They're completely yeah, confused. They're, like, standing there and they're just, like, I can't. Oh, my God. And, like, they'll just be, like, can you see? I can't. I can't tell the difference. And then this one person will come in and just be, like, are you joking? Like, they're totally different. And yes. I just think to myself, like, wow, what do their eyeballs see? Like, yeah. I just, I don't know. Anyway, no, I think you're really, I think you're, you're pretty different guys. Yeah, we're pretty different. But, um, but thank you for, you also make great music together. Thank you so much. And thanks yeah. for letting us do this separately. It's fair. It was an interesting situation. I loved it. I'm so curious as to whether or not you guys are going to listen to, like, just, I mean, number <laughs> I'll one, listen of to course, that, that would be interesting. No, I'll listen to Tegan's. Yeah. yeah. 
I'd listen. Actually, you know, it's weird because when we do press, um, I don't usually listen or look at my own, like if it was me. But if right. Tegan did something, I'll be like, oh, what Tegan do? Yeah. What did she do? We'll Is check up on each other. Do? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, I'll be like, oh, God, what did she say? You're both great. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> thanks, sir. <laughs> listeners that's our show please remember to rate and review us on itunes you can follow me on twitter at cameron esposito we are recorded by matt brousseau produced by sierra Catow and feral audio our theme song is by aw and you can find them at listen to aw.com thanks for listening to query feral audio